This is the Go Maluku podcast. Dave, how how are you doing? Like you, um, you've been um, yeah in the, in the movement for quite some time now, or quite some time, um, and you're relaxing. That's what I see because you're enjoying life. I I, I would I would I would hope uh, enjoying uh, your family life. How's that going for you right now? Uh, thanks, thanks. Uh... Uh, with the support of all our relatives, and close friends and neighbors, I think we are doing far better than we would have. Uh, we have a lovely boy of six years who keeps us very busy. He's doing now uh, uh, school, but it's uh, virtual. It's, it's in the next city. So thank God for that. And uh, my two older children. And, uh, so one of them has just passed 30. The other one's in her mid 20s. So I started life very early. Um, so I actually had to become chief, Raja, or whatever, of our territory called the Chakna Circle when I was 18. And I had just started college, as we call it here, mm-hmm. high school in the US. And uh, uh, and so it was being a student as well as uh, being the chief, circle chief, territorial chief. Uh, and that was also the time when there was uh, martial law. Our uh, indigenous political party had taken up arms. Just, I, I took it as chief in 1977. So this was, they, they started the movement to the, Four years before that, three years, where the armed struggle started. And, uh, so that, those were the days I, I felt, felt lost, actually, because, uh, you know, on the one hand, as a young person of 18, my heart was with the people who went into the jungle. You know, the whole family has really been experiences and experiences and uh, that's where I wanted to go and then on the other hand uh, because of uh, family lineage which, which goes back uh, more than 300 years that we have to take on the responsibility of being the chief which means yeah, you know guiding the work of more than 1000 village chiefs uh, and uh, uh, a lot of it is like uh, tribal justice system we try our own personal law cases like divorce, maintenance, uh, inheritance, but also minor criminal matters as well. So that was really the most important job of a chief, apart from the other one, uh, I think maybe was natural resource management. So in the case of the title lands, but more in the case of the untitled uh, lands, forests, Sweden lands, uh, you know, we are in the Indo- Burma, Myanmar, tri-border. So this is actually one of the mega biodiversity, was, was, of the East, biodiversity hotspots in the world. We had rhinoceros, Bengal tiger, we don't know. Bear, leopard, elephant, bison, wild dog. Anyway, so, you know, it's very rich in, in, in forest, subtropical forest. And so here, you know, uh, our, our lives then, you know, centuries ago to what we are now, um, we have a, we have, we hear rumors there may be another negotiation, another you know, peace talks and peace, uh, uh, I don't know, agreement or accord. Uh, because the last one we had was 1997, where uh, a few thousand guerrillas came back from the jungle after 20 years of armed struggle and made peace with the government. And, and that is the government actually led by our present prime minister, uh, Sheikh Hasina. And she actually got a UNESCO Peace Prize. I forget the name of the prize for peace. But anyway, so I, I, I'm talking about my when I was 18, when I was a little lost. But then if I didn't do that, who would do that? Not the guerrillas. I mean, of course. Their work that they have been much more important than what I was doing, but somebody had to deal with 
these things or somebody still dies, somebody still inherits, uh, somebody has a quarrel in the family, uh, these have to be dealt and also to allocate lands at the time. So, but I still had a lot of guilty conscience. And even when I actually went to England, which was like uh, five years on, and that of the gorilla was, well, was even more intense. And I even have a far deeper sort of sense of guilt. What am I doing in England studying law? And I did a degree and went for barristers, and for master for in London. And whilst my people are suffering in the jungle, were being raped, tortured. But anyway, but at the end of the, uh, I, I can sort of look at myself in the face, you know why, Ghazali? I was able to put my law training into useful work when our guerrillas made peace. So I was actually asked to come as some sort of a facilitator mm -hmm. by both the government and our guerrilla leader. And he's now the head of our regional, I don't know if you can call it government, a regional council, Mr. J.B. Larman. And so we, uh, uh, I, tried, I tried what I could to help them with my law training and also my exposure to, well, you know, indigenous peoples, uh, the movement in different ways. It wasn't really till the 90s, but even in the 80s after I came back from the UK in 1986, and we had a general, General H.M. Arshad, who actually had a nine year autocracy. And at the fag end of his rule, I, I left the country mm. because I felt that uh, my life was threatened, that I was under pressure to join a sham peace deal, which I did, I, I walked out of. So they were very, very angry, particularly the, the army general who was actually running it. Theoretically, it was running, being run by the, by the uh, 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 minister. Mm. But can I go back to sure, sure. the British days of what it was? And so actually, I told you about the war in the 1970s, ending in 1997, 20 years, more than 20 years later, from 73-ish. And from then, I take you back about 200 years, 1770s. And at that time, we had the British East India Company. So they had taken over Bengal, but they had not taken over most parts of India then, not even Myanmar. So the first foothold of the East India Company was in Bengal. And Bengal is on our borders. We are like, as the crow flies, 30, 40 kilometers from the plains of Chittagong. So not to confuse Chittagong Hill Tracks, which is my region, with Chittagong, the major port in, in, in Bangladesh. And, and so, you know, but we had dense forests, as I said, and the plains people were happy with their wet rice. Uh, they didn't very much like the forest and jungle, nor the hills, no. A very, very, very sort of dangerous type of malaria. That's often fatal. So also, I think we share this with Upper, uh, Myanmar, Burma. You know, our other friends from we share more of a chin stay, you know, mm -hmm. any of our chin friends, Rakhine friends, Mizo friends, <laughs> Tripura friends. And so the British wanted our lands. So the Bengali speaking people, the population rose and the British got more taxes from the wet rice cultivators because that's more intense rather than a shifting cultivation, you know, rotation in agriculture. So they wanted to take us, take, uh, take our lands over. And so in our quarrels with our then Raja, uh, John Bucks Khan, uh, although we are Buddhist, we used Mughal titles. Everybody, it was fashionable then. And uh, so we fought for 10 years. That was the first guerrilla war from 1777, and you have little, written records of this in English. 1777 to 10 years, 1787, there was a, uh, 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 a treaty between our 
Brune and the British Governor General, who was Lord Cornwallis. Now, I'm not sure whether the Lord Cornwallis, who was in Canada around that time, a little later perhaps, 1770s to 80s, was that Cornwallis or his son? I have no idea. I think the same person. So maybe they, they give us trouble here and then went to give the First Nations in Canada <laughs> as much or even more trouble than they gave us. So that was the first uh, guerrilla war. And then, you know, after that, for 200 years, we became peaceful farmers. We didn't fight. We were no longer warriors or fighters. But then we had to fight with the British East India Company. And then, of course, we lost, but we never sort of, it wasn't the victory of that sort where lots of people were killed, there were some who died, but they cut off the supply of salt. And we had diseases like very, very, because we, the coast. And so our king went and made peace because some old lady had said, what sort of a ruler do we have who forgets his own people and fights with a foreign enemy whilst we are dying and running? Or maybe it was a pregnant woman. So he made peace, we became a British territory. And then, you know, gradually, gradually from a tributary, first we prayed tribute, but we're not British subjects. They let us alone. They didn't want us anyway. But later on, they wanted the forest. They wanted tea trees. They wanted our trees. They wanted our bamboo. They wanted our fish. So they gradually took us over, over to Pakistan in 1947. Although they said Muslim majority areas should be formed in Pakistan. And we were not, we were, Muslim, we were a Muslim minority area, we were majority Buddhist and Hindu area. So, but as this is my definition of indigenous people, Ghazali, I don't know. Maybe I'll write about it. Who are indigenous peoples? Indigenous peoples are those who do not have any right to choose the roof over the house they live in, the state. Mm. You ask, it's a litmus test, 90 something percent of people, maybe it's different in Bolivia recently, or I don't know, very, very few countries, I don't know, like. Fiji, or parts of, I don't know, Malaysia and uh, Northeast India. But you ask them, they'll say, no, they didn't even ask us. We just got that roof, the state, so we got Pakistan. But then it was not just us non-Muslims, our neighbors, the Bengali-speaking Muslims, they, didn't, they couldn't live with Pakistan either. So that, that was a showcase of saying that you can't just create a state based on religion. So they were both Muslim religion, but one was Bengali speaking a different culture in Bangladesh, that's the majority. Where you had it in Pakistan, you had Punjabis, Pashtun, uh, uh, Baloj, and Sindhis, and all. So Bangladesh came. But again, in 71, when you asked us, did anyone ask us? No. So we found ourselves in Bangladesh. Uh, although we are linguistically, uh, we are religiously and ethnically minority. But we are also indigenous people. So, so the question was how much autonomy should we have within Bangladesh? And then so in British times, uh, we had a very similar status to parts of Northeast India. You, know, you have Naga land, Mizoram, Meghalaya, and in Myanmar, you had, we should hear the old names. You know what it was? We had Chirigam Hill Tracks. It was Ar Arakan Hill Tracks, Kachin Hill Tracks, Chin Hill Tracks. Now that Hill Tracks name is gone. Only we are saddled with it. So they have become Chin, a Chin state and part of the Kain and the Chin state uh, 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 and so forth. Uh, so they had those laws where the central government ruled a central British colonial government and then, uh, but the provincial government where our close uh, non-indigenous uh, brothers and sisters of the majority, they ran the provincial and local governments, but they were excluded. But anyway, that may be boring for a lot of people. But the thing is, it's still important that when we didn't get a state, we, we couldn't get choose that roof over our head, the state. Can we have a sub-state? And here is the whole thing of, you know, Article 3 of the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, self-determination and the next article four or three is autonomy but there is no fixed definition of autonomy I mean, you can call it uh, provincial it, 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 it's not a full state but you can have a, a 
autonomy like in some parts of Northeast India, Boro land. Now I think the Bangsamoro and in 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 Mindanao have got uh, autonomy within a unitary state. But then Indonesia, I suppose, where your people are, I mean, it varies so much. I mean, and we know the difficulties in many, many regions, West Papua, your region, and many others. So we are still struggling with how the Bangladeshi state can accommodate autonomy, whatever name you call it. And, and, and the problem is that politicians and bureaucrats tend to think that uh, that, that self-determination of a people is the inverse of sovereignty and territorial integrity, which of course we don't agree with. That's why we've got, and even the states didn't agree with, they wouldn't have let us have that, that article three of self-determination in the, in, the, in the UN declaration. But then they could also not say, could they say that when the UN charter after the League of Nations was done, this all peoples have the right of self-determination except indigenous peoples. They can't say that. That would be downright discriminatory. So whether you or not you had certain things in your contemplation when you wrote those legal phrases, but they have to be given their ordinary meaning in a world which is different. So I sometimes find it very hard to understand why sometimes people say that Hey, in the US, we go back to the framers of the constitution in 1776 and try to understand what they thought. And then we interpret that in the US today. And what's gonna to happen to the rights of the First Nations, the Native Americans, the African Americans, uh, the Hispanic Americans, the East Asians and all that. So I, I don't see how people can say it, but anyway, what we indigenous peoples, I always feel, have to really, really push, push the envelope and say that human rights law can never be, what's the word of progressive, regressive. It can't go backwards. So when I was actually trying to do some research, although that's still theory, Ghazali, I, I, I must admit that here, my, 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 my sort of work, sometimes as a, uh, as a researcher, I have written about the constitution of Nepal, I've written about uh, employment, I've written about, you know, the ILO conventions. Uh, so theoretically, if you talk to the committee of experts, I'll tell you about the problem with the ILO too, as I feel it. Mm. You have the 1957 Convention on uh, uh, Indigenous and Tribal Populations. I'm talking about this because this is the only direct treaty we have. The others are declarations and other things. Okay, so 1957, 107. You know, then came all those other developments in between Kobo's monumental study on discrimination against Indigenous peoples to many other developments happening uh, in different parts of the world. And then you have the it was revised in 1989, I think uh, James and I and many of our friends uh, were there in, in Geneva uh, negotiating the new Convention 169. It happened. But still, many, many countries which uh, were party to 107, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, and would you believe, Iraq. And I forget one Latin American country too. A lot of them have not one forward to uh, accept Convention 169 and in Asia, including Oceania, it's, it's just Fiji and uh, Nepal. But, but there's one thing, the committee of experts, which monitors the, the provisions of the, the convention, the treaty, they say that when they are monitoring 107, they will ignore the assimilationist orientation of 107. Because in 107, 1957, they thought, hey, these guys who are indigenous and tribal, they actually want to become non-tribal and non-indigenous and assimilate to greater uh, mainstream society. So our job is to just just, just uh, uh, make it a little gentle, that, that 
make that transition, sorry, uh, uh, gentle, so, so that they become, you know, uh, without a joke, they become non-indigenous and non-tribal and, you know, uh, be like the rest of us. And they realized that that didn't happen. So the committee of experts said, and I did the study on Bangladesh in particular, and also a few others, no, we will ignore the assimilationist orientation. And so we will assume that it's not a transition, that indigenous peoples are going to remain indigenous peoples if they wish to do so with their own customs, traditions, and so forth. But we will help them with land rights, collective land rights, right to uh, mother, mother tongue, uh, right to employment and training and all that. You know, it, it, it's quite uh, 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 modest when you compare it to 169 and Brick. But the thing is, so you can still say that, hey, in today's world, when you have passed the UN Declaration, you have a progressive uh, uh, treaties on the rights of women, on, on persons with disability, on uh, children, rights of the child, too many, many things. You can't think of how they did it in 1957. So you in the US cannot also think how they did it in 1776. Not in Indonesia, not in Bangladesh, nor anywhere else. Whether or not your constitution does that. So I think, of course, there have been positive examples, of, you know, uh, like in Nicaragua, you know, I was thinking a case with James and I and all uh, Nicaragua, how they, the Inter-American Commission and court said the, the Nicaraguan state cannot, cannot, you know, uh, ignore the rights of the Awastigmi community. I actually went there by helicopter with our friend Mirna took us. The Permanent Forum was there on a visit. And because these people, you know, were there way before the Nicaraguan state was born. So there are other examples like, you know, in Australia, the Mabo number two and all that. But there, I think we're still not trying hard enough in our national constitutional courts. I know that the dice is loaded, but where do we go? Do we take up guns? Okay, well, it's for each people to choose whether that's right or wrong. It's not for me to say. But I don't think that is the answer. Uh, uh, so we need to explore, just as I'm saying that we need to explore at the international level. You know, I've been saying this, Ghazali, for years. Instead of, you know, us going to the permanent forum and, and Emirate, like, like, you're like 800, 1,000, uh, 1500, you know what I'm joking to say? And your friends start clapping in before you finish your speech. It can't be like that, you know, all your buddies you've known for donkeys years are there and uh, it, it's good. But then what perhaps changes more are the treaty bodies where our good friend Pancho just spoke to him the other day, virtually. And, you know, he was for so many years in Sir, the committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination before becoming Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Peoples. And there were others. And that's where I think we should be going more. And I was speaking to Evgi and many of the other our friends that, and they have changed that, you know, they will fund more, or even the, even the, uh, even the bond fund, that you, you also go to the treaty bodies and other, other mechanisms apart from the permanent forum Although I was a member for two terms and I went there, I was there before it was born. I was in the prep meeting. So let me not talk ill of the firm for that's achieved a lot. It can achieve more, but more of us should be going to that. We should be going to the, I don't know, the WIPO, WTO. But again, uh, here, maybe Ghazali, I'm getting old. I told you I'm 62, running 63. So here I go on. But years and years of looking at things, you. Even as I speak now, in our region, there is a takeover of a land of, a, of an indigenous people, the Moro people in the Southern Hill tribes. Mm. And we have two special rapporteurs, and I think the Working Group on Business and Human Rights, or what it was technically called, and still it hasn't stopped. So many of the critiques 
of human rights or indigenous rights in the UN system can quite rightly to an extent say, hey, what's the, what's the use of you know, going all the way? And I, I know some friends, uh, there are some uh, indigenous friends in Sarawak, you know, I, I forget the names now. A lot of, some of them are lawyers. He said, hey, we're too busy. We don't have time for Geneva, New York, and we're not. They're too busy fighting cases or fighting the struggle out there in the field, in the streets, or doing politics. But I would still say that for those who are engaging in the international arena, particularly the UN, but also, you know, it can be the European system, it can be the trade, uh, W2 and so forth, uh, or, you know, climate change, biological diversity, you name it. But you first get these, it's the same states who are members of the United Nations and its different bodies. For example, the most important states, the richest states, they own the World Bank and the regional banks. We have, we have the Asian Development Bank, we have the Inter-American African and, but there it's one dollar, one vote. In the UN, it's one country, one vote. But it's still them, and they can behave differently, but still, if you get a resolution from a treaty body, from, let's say, the Human Rights Council during its uh, universal periodic review or, or its annual, biannual sessions or other bodies, then the difficult thing is to use that to lobby your government. In the old days, we used to call it name and shame. You know? I'm not politically correct now, so I can't say it. Yeah? I'm not <laughs> supposed to say it, but I'm going to say it. It did have its values, and you may not call it that in the days of political correctness, but that's what you mean. You want to put some pressure on your government that it's embarrassed enough to do something about it. But the difference, th there is some difference between a treaty body, some statement from a special rapporteur, or other specialized mechanism of the human rights procedures and other things that come out from human rights and indigenous rights bodies. But the end of the day, you see here, let me be I, I'm reminded of my human rights teachers at university. They used to tell me probably, you know, you're quite aware of that, but the only human rights system with teeth is the European system because it's backed by the European court, the judicial body, European commission, which is the executive body. That is the cabinet. That is the ministry of the European Union. Even the inter-American court it, it, it can't just say, hey, we're going to send some troops to Nicaragua or to Panama to do that, but they can't. So th there, the difference between a treaty and a declaration or other instrument that you use, for example, in the, in, in the UPR, in the UPR, the UPR, you, you can invoke uh, uh, non-treaty instruments, et cetera, as well. The difference at the end of the day is how you use it in, with the press, the media, and I dare say politics. Although I'm not politics, that's not made for. My father was, he was elected to parliament and a few other people in my family. I don't think I will ever enter politics of that sort for a sort of you know for a, for a, for a place in uh, in the assembly uh, uh, or whatever. Although by accident I was a minister of state for one year. That was a caretaker. Our job. 2008, uh, January, January or February to 2009. And our job was to hold free and fair elections. And I think we did, the 14 of us. And it changed so, in Bangladesh. And I think one of the fairest elections in Bangladesh happened. Uh, so after we went back to whatever we were. We were mostly, you know, lawyers, civil, ex civil servants, even retired generals, businessmen, NGOs. Uh, academics, <laughs> quite an inter interesting lot. I miss some of them have passed on, passed away. But anyway, so what I'm 
trying to get on Ghazali, so that you can please interrupt and point me to any other things that I, uh, you think I ought to, you know, uh, uh, talk more on or talk less on. But I, I, I want to talk about strategy. You know? So I started off the UN and international mechanism, but I think even in the national courts, we should be using it more. We might lose, but then you see, most constitutions have all those words, all people are equal, and you may not discriminate against them on the basis of race, religion, ethnicity, gender. I'm sure every single constitution in the world has that. But then you have to bring in practical ways. What's the UN declaration? I think it was Dr. Paul Joff, or was it the Grand Council of the Cree? No, Paul Joff said that almost every article of the UN declaration is part of some other instrument already adopted. We just put them all together in one. And there was, I think, the Grand Council of the Cree once said that for every single article of the UN Declaration, there was some violation in history, for which reason we needed to correct that. So my, my point is really that let us try to use the jurisprudence from the treaty bodies, from the UN, from even countries, and try to sort of play on to the egos and the hearts and whatever, if they have a heart and a soul and uh, of our judges in the superior courts and see you know, uh, whether we can. And in fact, I must say, apart from one or two, the few times, I, I don't practice law for money now, not for the last 10 something years after uh, our uh, uh, 97 Accord came even before that was ceasefire in the mid and early 90s. I stopped sort of practicing. And otherwise, you know, what could I do as a chief? The, it was the military and the guerrillas, they did everything. So we non military, non guerrilla guys had little to do. So I went to Dhaka to practice law. And I thought I'll need some constitution lawyers and maybe we can do it to the courts. But the few cases I have gone and mostly, you know, as pro bono, very little I do uh, is. We did get good judgments. I must say, uh, on personal law some years ago, and here was a very fair judge. A, a, a judge, a Muslim woman wearing a hijab, but a very fair person. And she gave us the judgment when we said, we Buddhists are not Hindus. Somebody said, the Buddhists are regulated by Hindu law. I said, no. We said Milo. We, we don't say Milady. <laughs> we still use those words, but not not the week. <laughs> uh, that our courts uh, and, and she took our uh, argument uh, along with Barrister Sarah was saying a colleague, uh, and we said that we have our own personal laws. We are neither Hindu law nor Muslim law nor Christian law. We have tribal law, and she took it, and now that's law. Then uh, we went to some of the even the higher court, the appellate division where we have a special regulation called the Chittagong Hill Tracks Regulation. And if there are, if there are any, any people from Myanmar, then they would know that the Chin Hills Regulation, uh, then there was also, I think, the, the, the Kachin Hills, uh, I forget it was regulation or something, and also Mizoram Nagaland, same law. And this, of that sort of, I don't know if the word is genre, but anyway, uh, of that style, of that period, those intentions of, uh, having indirect rule through chiefs. And that law was upheld by our Supreme Court. And they said this is indirectly uh, recognized by our constitution, is, 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 is uh, in tune with our constitution. And that therefore, other laws may not be directly applied to our region. So, so until today, all laws are applicable to the rest of Bangladesh or not. So what I'm basically saying is that as in the international sphere, particularly the UN bodies, so also in the national sphere, but also even in not just courts, when you are talking about, say, this, the sustainable development rules, the SDGs, that we drag in things from the UN declaration to put me, I mean, how can you have uh, uh, quality uh, education if you don't remember, you know, where these students live, what languages they speak, which script they're familiar with, how many words they walk to that school or how do they go to that college or university. So 
you cannot have really implement the SDGs unless you do it in contextually appropriate ways. And wait, that's where if you bring in the entire UN declaration, when you say it never says special right, it says special measures. There is no such thing as special right. But we have the equal right to be treated not, not mathematically equally, but so that the end result is that I am not deprived, I am not excluded. So I think we should also be using those examples, the, the outcome document of the World Conference of Indigenous Peoples. Remember the running around the cafes in New York? There's <laughs> 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 only of our friends trying to, to uh, in a negotiate language with the governments and even having coffee with them, with the governments and all that. Um, I, I was reminded of a meeting in Pátzcuaro, Mexico, where a lot of the you know uh, differences with the American, British, you know the big biggies, bro. Actually, they made a amateur film about it, and so I can share that with anyone who wants uh, to actually see many people who have passed away. Madam Dias, Erica Dias, Professor Erica Dias. Uh, I forget uh, who was with uh, uh, Martin Escobo from Guatemala. I, I forget the gentleman's name. Diaz, Doctor doc, Doctor Diaz. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and many others. Did I hear Estevancio? Uh, I, I was really shocked. I was really shocked. I just got it yesterday. So, so many of our friends are not there. But anyway, let, let me now ask you, Ghazali, you tell me where I should be heading. No, it is. For... <laughs> this really. <I> <laughs> Thanks so much, um, Dev. This almost feel like like a master class of of you finally and eloquently explaining um and, and going through the motion it, it is like the bangladesh context the international law the uh conundrum uh of of of, of customary law international law um the understanding of autonomy um and the use of the the the, uh, the treaty bodies which is I, I very much agree with you they're underused are underutilized by indigenous peoples and also i am yeah some somewhat um amazed actually that we do not because pancho was the only one only people a per person that we had at the treaty bodies as an expert now he's a special rapporteur and you would think that aside from using the treaty bodies more, because it is, I agree with you, it, is, it has teeth within the UN context. Um, but we, could, we should also try to, to get indigenous uh, experts or activists in the, the, the treaty bodies. It would, it would definitely um, increase the legitimacy of the, 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 uh, the treaties and also the application of the treaties um, making it make it a better reflection of humanity um, and also the inclusion of the rights of indigenous peoples, obviously. And so there's so many things that, that, that they're talking about that I, I, I just, you know, you're one of the few people that, and here's, I, I don't think you can remember this, but there's one example uh, at the Prima Forum that made me go, wow, this is amazing. Um, you were in a, a, I think it was a, it was a, a half day discussion and uh, you had the World Bank and some other uh, institutions and you took the floor and it almost felt like a U.S. Congress hearing, um, yeah, you, uh, you, you talking to, to, the, to the World Bank and it being very critical. And I'm not talking about talking them down, but very critical of their, of their, um, of their regulations, of their of their policies, um, and and trying to make sure that they um, are in line with the rights of indigenous peoples, We're in line with the declaration on the UN, on the UN declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples, and that was um, yeah uh, one of the moments that I was like yeah um, one of the many don't get me wrong one of the many uh, moments that I'm, I'm I was super impressed also. Um, we both were at the World, uh, at the at the at the uh, in New York before the World Conference and meetings and the way that you took the floor. It, it is something that is 
I know that there's a lot of people out there, indigenous youth out there that aspire to be that eloquent about um, advocacy or diplomacy. Because um, the one thing that you said right uh, just now uh, st st um, struck me very well because I was in a meeting yesterday with, with, uh, with indigenous peoples, particularly focused on climate change. And there's one, one particular issue uh, which has to, to, to do with uh, market mechanisms, you know, the carbon market mechanisms. And um, as I try to coordinate the, the negotiations or the advocacy efforts from the indigenous point of view, um, I try to lay out, explain to them, well, the declaration needs to be the normative framework. And these are the countries that you need to, that we need to um, yeah, approach and try to, um, um, yeah, make them, um, not not make them, but 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 let's yeah to approach them and try to make them understand why human rights and the rights of indigenous peoples are important, and then the reflex I would say, uh, the reflex from some people was along the line of naming and shaming, and whereas um, I believe in uh, when it comes to rights advocacy, uh, there is a time for naming and shaming. But there's um, pressurizing is a better way to describe it. Like you, like you, like you said, um, pressure them enough um, with um, yeah, um, uh, documents or treaties or whatever um, that 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 can that can compel them to 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 do it without naming and shaming. Which because there, there is always a a point in time, I would say later in time that you can resort to that particular uh, issue. Um, I don't, I'm not, I don't know where I want to go with this. Oh yeah, maybe, yeah. I think can I can I ask you to take you to um, yeah, take us or people through your thought process when you thought when you um, when you thought about when you said well, there's no fixed definition of of autonomy. That is, and my question is, um, if if you see there's no fixed definition of autonomy. How do you look at uh, the um, the understanding of many people that there's a fixed definition of self-determination? How, how how would you um, yeah how, how do how do how do you think about that? As I said earlier, Ghazali, uh, there are many within the states which tend to look at you know uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity and uh, self-determination and including autonomy as a form of governance self-governance uh, being uh, inverse that more of one is less of the other but this is where actually uh, Professor Stavenhagen, who was, it was the first special rapporteur of Indigenous people, wasn't he? And he wrote so articulately that, no, it's just the opposite, he said. In, in most cases, it is the denial of self-determination, which leads to particularly secessionism, as they, some people use the word, mm. where, where uh, you know, there was no other way. And in fact, perhaps Bangladesh, is an example of self-determination on two counts. One count is historically you as a people had your right to form your own state. In fact, there's the famous Lahore resolution where actually some of the movers of Lahore resolution, a resolution to have Pakistan as a state for the majority Muslim people of then India was done by Bangladeshi. Bengali speaking. So that was there, but it was also because in 1971, the Pakistani army, what it did to the people of Bangladesh, where it really, you know, uh, the worst rape, arson, pillage, murder, torture, that that gave rise. I, I, I don't want to use, you know, technical words, but I have mean, no other way I'm doing it. So some people call it, I think maybe James and I have to say, remedial self-determination. Mm, no, yeah. 
that you know, because you hurt me so bad, then I, I now have the right to not stay in your state anymore. But so that's another type. But 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 whether or not, and I, I say this that these states tend to think that self-determination, you know, is something basically only meaning secession or independence. And why do you have it in the common article two of the of the of the civil and uh, uh, civil and political rights covenant and the economic, social, and cultural rights covenants, which uh, were adopted in 16, 1966 and came into force in 1976. Well, first, article number one of those two covenants says all peoples have the right of self determination or to self determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine the political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. So, that is a basic human right and one of the few collective rights. And I, and I want to get onto that a little bit at some stage of individual versus collective rights mm. or individual and if not versus, and, and then also on customary law. If, if, please, if, please. Now, so if self-determination is there in those two covenants and you know, most countries in the world have ratified one or the other or, or both. And although many countries are sh have shied away from the optional protocols, like the USA shied away then from the Kyoto Protocol to the climate change convention. And so more and more, you doesn't matter, you call it yourself a federation. You could call yourself a federation, but in Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak, police is not a state subject. I was quite surprised to see. Mm. Whereas sometimes I think even in so-called unitary states, police can be decentralized. And we are seeking that. Our 1997 agreement says there'll be police force in the Chittagong Hill tracks and, and, and officers up to the sub-inspector level will be, will be recruited. We haven't got that yet. Mm. But so conceptually, it's a matter of degree whether you want to call yourself a federation and yet the central government keeps a lot of the past, or you call what is say the United King is the first unitary government. So now they've got, you know, Scot Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales. And if you're really anybody curious can have a look at the Isle of Man, Isle mm -hmm. of Wight, and Jersey, where it's not the Westminster Parliament that does that the, in Isle of Man there, the Max Parliament. So all these theories that come from, you know, I, I think the 1950s political science and all that, which really gets in the way and says, hey, 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 self-determination, this is like secession. Then I said, do a people exercise the self-determination once in the land and go to sleep? Did the people of Bangladesh uh, declare their independence on 26th March? And you me and go to sleep? Did the Americans declare it on 4th of July, 1776 and go to sleep? Hmm. Self-determination is something you keep on exercising and it's a right of a people and indigenous peoples are people. So that's where UN declaration, the, the states which at first were very, very queasy, were very wary against self-determination, gradually agreed to it. And also indigenous peoples, you know, invoke it with a sense of responsibility. Uh, if it were the only the UN declaration, then you would have had you would have had no self determination movements before the UN declaration was passed. Mm. No, and I think it's basically parochial ideas of politicians who believe in poor ultra chauvinism and the line between nationalism and chauvinism shall be very very thin. Mm. So, and 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 also bureaucrats and. The more corrupt your government is, the more, you know, people, you know, get on to, you know, what do you call that? Uh, uh, people who just, you know, sing to the audience and all that. Uh, then you find that those ministers and those politicians are not really running the country. It's, by default, it's the bureaucrats who run the country because the politicians don't have the time to understand the laws or the people, they just want to get elected and make the million or keep their million or whatever it is.
Mm -hmm. uh, so at the practical level, it is a challenge, but I think that it is also a question of how people learn to exercise their right and learn to exercise their self-determination in a, in a responsible manner and also doing your homework. So, and, and, and I hope my, my friends uh, uh, in, these are very close friends and I say it with as much humility as I can, but I, because I love them so much mm. in Nepal, because I know our friends in Nepal that they did not get in the new constitution what they, there was an agreement to give them. And I actually did some work along with John Hendricks and I went to land on the Nepali constitution and so many of our friends in Nefin, and even today they are having the problem with the, uh, uh, in the valley, their lands have been taken over for a highway. But, but uh, I wonder if they're also working hard to use the current constitution. I know many are, our friend Shankar Limbo to many others. They're working, I have so much respect for them. I met 100 members of the Constituent Assembly, first Constituent Assembly, they were one third. But, but, but also what can be done to use the protected areas, not, not Conventional biologically protected areas, by the way. These are other terms that the Nepal constitution uses, where you get some sort of autonomy, sub level of a province, less than a province of state. That, and, and in Northeast India, then are the, there are these north, uh, autonomous district councils where actually the district council can pass laws for land ownership, land transfer. They have their own courts, which excludes both the province or state and the federal government. So mm. I call it, what is the Russian doll called? I forget, Matryoshka, Katryoshka, I forget. Doll within a doll within a doll. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Matryoshka? Matryoshka. Yeah. So it's layered autonomy. Mm. And, and there's also the whole concept and people in Northeast India and uh, Northern Myanmar would understand, Northern Burma. Uh, excluded area, fully excluded area, partially excluded area. So mm. the whole game of autonomy is actually who you include and who you exclude. Mm. So in the district council, say the Chakmas are a minority. They have a district council in Mizoram. The Mizo are the majority in the province, but then the central government in India in Delhi. So the Chakmas say, hey, I want to do my land and my tribal justice thing the way I want. This is not Chakmadar Hill tribes. My fellow tribesmen are also across the border in India. They have a district council. So they pass their laws with the assent of the governor on land ownership, land allocation, land transfer, up to secondary education, I think, and a few other things. But they exclude this provincial government of Mizos. Then the Mizo government excludes the central government, the central government of India through a special constitutional dispensation dispensation, cannot pass a law on social and religious customs and land ownership, mm. et cetera, without the consent of the legislative assembly of the state. So here, autonomy is a matter of exclusion, who you exclude for what. But it's also a kind of who you include for what. Mizoram is a deficit state. And so as I think most states in the Northeast and, and in many parts of even say, think category, Indonesia, Malaysia, or Philippines, or Central America. Then the, the others who are better off, the center needs to give you the funds. So here it's a question of inclusion. And you are included in the package on healthcare. Then it's a question of not exclusion, but inclusion. But we want to exclude them from things that we think they don't understand much about, our culture, our language, our teaching methods, so on and so forth. Mm. Uh, I, shall I get into the individual collect thing a bit? Uh, please, please. Um, and I, 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 I just remember, I will not name the government, uh, during the drafting of the UN declarations, and uh, you may recall that uh, along with Jose Carlos Morales, uh, the two of us were co-chairs of the Indigenous People's Caucus in the last two sessions. Mm. Uh, what was passed on to the new Human Rights Council. So anyway, at uh, one stage, you know, there's this whole thing about collective rights. Of course we are, you know, because uh, apart from self-determination, there are many, many, many things that 
uh, it's only applies to indigenous people, the collective rights, of, you know, like land, territories, and resources, but also many of our like our justice systems, uh, our juridical rights, and many others. And sometimes they couple up as individual rights. I want to get to that, but before that, I just wanted to say something that uh, I, I, I remember that there was one government, anyway, a very powerful government, I should not say. So whenever there was an article on collective rights, uh, in this case, it was a he, but there were many she's as well. Mm -hmm. that, uh, said, asked the chairperson that, that that article should add the term indigenous and along with collective rights. So indigenous and collective rights. So it was, I, I was quite tired. Uh, my, my, my temper was not uh, uh, very good. <laughs> and I've sort of had it, so I, I raised my hands. And it was a very powerful one. So was the chairperson, it was Ambassador uh, Chavez of Peru. I said, if we follow through to its logical conclusion, the proposal of the government of such and such, we will have to rename the entire title of the declaration and call it the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Individuals and Peoples. And the whole room laughed. <laughs> and that delegate did not talk for the next two days or so and that really took the sort of thing away from all those you know spoilers coming in to sort of just delay the passage of the declaration and you mm. know, finicky things small things but to more serious matters is that that of course our collective rights and this is where i want to mention uh, right a bit later uh, a custom we chakmas called malaya that means if I call Malaya to repair our house roof or to a harvest paddy because I don't have enough person power, manpower, I'm a vedua, I'm a vedua, I'm a person with disability, then the entire village must come. And I think most in all, almost all indigenous people have that in the rural areas. They have different names for it. And then there's feasting and merrymaking. And there's a slight variant where uh, in, in the Malaya, the host gives the food and a little bit of rice wine. And in, in the variant, the, work, the, the, the volunteers come. So to me, this is a very collective rights oriented thing. Here you're sharing your labor. But if you have a surplus, you also share your harvest. So that's why amongst the Chakma people, many other peoples, there were very few rich people in the community. And that's because those who had a harvest surplus had to share with those who didn't. But anyway, now coming to the individual collective things, although we did, did, you know, obtain the recognition of our collective rights and we are struggling to get those implemented on the ground, but it's also important that in some cases we must understand which right to invoke in which manner. And mm. I will never forget that this was a Sami person, a woman, uh, I forgot her name, I remember her spouse's name, but I shall not say it, <laughs> because I'm embarrassed that I should have forgotten her name, They're both, That's okay. both friends, and she said, a child's right to mother tongue is not just a collective right of the Sami people, the Chakma people, or whichever collective entity, it's all an individual right of that individual Sami child. That way, if that Sami child is not living in Harajok in Norway, mm. but is living in a locality in, 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 in Oslo, you still have that right and that has to be the, the, the duty bearer of the state has to do something about it. And so that way, we need to be creative in thinking that it's not always collective rights. Then if you put it in that, this, hey, you've got the Samis living in Finnmark County, which is 90% or 80%, 70% of the world. So what are you, so that's your collective right. The Sami people are not losing the Sami language. We've got your Sami 
parliament over there. Why do you living in Oslo need that individual right? You strive for collective rights. Oh, go, go to Denmark County and speak your Sami language. So, but here she said, no, I am a Sami. I live in Norway or Finland or Sweden or Russia. And I have the right to speak Sami. And, and so that's where with regard to like even healthcare, and many other things uh, uh, with education, many things. I think we ought to, you know, remember both. And, and in fact, the first few articles I've got, I won't read it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've got the little, little <laughs> book in, with me, that there are many rights. Uh, and it says that we are entitled to all the individual and collective rights without discrimination. Mm. And so we, we need to be sort of uh, uh, very, very strategic in, in uh, invoking the rights and then trying to get the duty bearer, which is usually the state, but, but of course, let us not let also the market or things like the World Bank. And mm. in fact, I want to say something about the World Bank before. Hmm. I move on to customary law, unless you have other things to tell me to <laughs> steer me around. Uh, remember going to Washington, D.C., and one of the World Bank lawyers telling us, hey, we are not uh, a state. We have not ratified any treaty. Why should human rights bind us? And I remember saying, as a number one, Although you have shares among the states to make up your, for some reason, and I really don't remember what the reason was, but the World Bank is a UN agency. The, the Asian Development Bank is not, the others not, but World Bank is, mm. not the Finance Corporation. So I said, as a member of the UN, as a specialist agency of the UN, you are bound to respect. I said, two, all the shareholders are countries. They are members of the UN. Mm. And how can they ride roughshod over uh, the, the, the human rights? And then I, I gave uh, an example. I said, uh, I suppose the World Bank has not ratified CEDO, has it? So it's, of course, they said, no, no. Well, you can't ratify it anyway if you wanted to, because you're not a state, are you? But if tomorrow in Washington, D.C., you had 99.9% .9 women and 0.1% men, do you think you could have an office in Washington, D.C.? Would you survive? Hmm. Well, you haven't run it, but you're not bound. And, 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 and that sort of broke the ice. And, and, and I think they realized that, that there is a moral element to all this that you can't. And that's where I think, and I have actually been involved in the shift uh, uh, you know, to OD420, to OPBC410, the last one is in the Philippines, where unfortunately they have sort of decentralized the understanding of indigenous peoples. But still, the World Bank is bound to follow its, its policies. There, in fact, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, some of us, including you might know, Pallab Chakma Kapeng Foundation. Mm -hmm. So we actually critiqued a policy, a, a project of the World Bank build a border road and we actually complained right up to the Washington DC and they stopped. Mm. They stopped because they violated their own policy. And we and we demonstrated how they violated their own policy. So I think this is another thing that I would like to speak to my friends in countries, you know, Latin America, Africa and uh, Asia in particular, when there are huge projects of the World Bank. International Finance Corporation and, um, well, anyway, the, the Bretton Woods institutions, as mm -hmm. well as the regional banks, that uh, we need to really work and understand those, those uh, safeguard policies that they have, indigenous peoples, involuntary resettlement, culture, education, uh, gender, environment, and be very careful and see where, because in most cases, you know, the bank gives the responsibility to the borrower government. And then the borrower government does what it likes to them, hire some, some company to do some research and all that. And 
does some sham consultation. But if you mm. can prove those, those consultations, the sham, and I know we have a, still have a problem with the consul. And I don't know, this is one of the meeting where actually was, uh, I was asked to chair that sort of dialogue with the World Bank. I don't know if that was the one you were mentioning. I was saying it's been much too long uh, that the World Bank is dragging its uh, feet about mm. uh, changing the policy and also particularly the question of, of, of free prior informed consent. And I remember they used to invite people to dinner or breakfast. I refuse to go to any single one of them. If they're serious, why don't you have a discussion in Washington, D.C. or whichever country? You just uh, ride piggyback on the permanent forum, drive over from Washington, D.C. and you know, give a breakfast and you think they're going to say yes to your FPIC, even if you say consultation or whatever it is. Mm. But anyway, so, uh, but I think we need to engage rather than just you know, critiquing. I have nothing against those who critique, who do demonstrations, and, 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 and I feel that in many cases that works more than a petition or friendly negotiation, but it's context specific and it depends on the individual or party or group or NGO or organization concerned where you put your emphasis on. Mm. There's no single perfect theory uh, no single perfect way of, of, of achieving your rights, uh, whether you're facing the government or the market economy or the corporation. And that's the other thing where I, I, I have been involved with years, particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, with agribusiness, uh, particularly oil palm and uh, many other such enterprises where big, big companies you know, they can buy up a whole developing nation and because our developing nations want to show off their brand new airports and highways and I don't know, presidential palaces, I don't know, five star mm. hotels, uh, and that they need all that money. So, and, and, and of course, it's indigenous peoples and peasant farmers who are suffering from, 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 from these. Uh, it's not just transnational cooperation. It doesn't matter if it's transnational or national. Mm. It's private entities who are selling people down, you know, the drain to get the, a quick buck. And that, of course, and that is where we, we, we found that it's, it's sometimes your state is so weak, it's no use getting to your government. What do you do? You get to the shareholders. You try to link up the chain, the value chain, and try to get even the shareholders. Mm. And this is where I also found, on the one hand, that customary law was sort of pushed to the margins. But on the other hand, customary law was a tool with which you engaged with the outside of the state or the market or the company from a position of advantage. And this is where actually, I have written on this, so whoever is interested can read mm. from Minority Rights Group to a few other uh, uh, publications, uh, that it is a tool which, you see, uh, this is also to me as a science student of law, uh, of jurisprudence interesting. Remember what, the Austin said the definition of law, law is the command of the sovereign. Mm -hmm. Now, what is customary law? Customary law is the command of the community. It is necessarily made by people, not your parliament or government, not a creator, mm -hmm. but there are certain traditions where creator, the God, can, uh, is also uh, an origin, a source of law. Mm -hmm. But customary law, the source is the community itself. And I am very, very happy that our Supreme Court has recognized customary law. And this is one of the few uh, uh, places where customary law, even in the laws of the Chittagong Hill Tracks, it is recognized without definition. So like you say, the laws, customs and practices of the Chittagong Hill Tracks are recognized and land conflicts 
must be resolved by uh, in accordance with these with mm. these laws yeah. and so but of course there are many other places where customary law has a far higher status than chirigon hill tracks for example saba sarawak in malaysia or even parts of cordillera as you know indigenous peoples rights act in the philippines and nagaland and mizoram but still and i missed this a friend of mine he recently died a professor of sociology in 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 northeastern hill university in in meghalaya india hmm. so he and i saw together that hey customary law is what we change we create so and in in our case it's customary law although personal law is recognized like you will know that if you are you live in malaysia or india or pakistan and bangladesh that each community has its own law tribes have their own muslim hindu christian but in the case of lands and forests that's where uh customary law the status is varied and and this is one thing also that tends to bug me a lot mm. because on the one hand uh, more than 25% of our lands in my region is theoretically forest reserve and this was declared when when the british came in 1870s 100 years after our ancestor was you know uh, colonized and he had the treaty with lord cornwallis because they wanted to have teak plantations for the railroads and so we we, we jokingly say the british called this a reserve forest did they bring the trees from london did they bring all those creatures from london did they create a forest and one of my activist friends his name is shudat tubikesh tonchinder he says only god or nature can create a forest human beings can create plantations not forest mm. but 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 you know if you look at the forest laws of india is an ex- exception they have the forest dwellers rights act but from nepal to bangladesh to Myanmar, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines. It's it's a huge status law. Mm. Eminent domain sort of a thing that the state points its finger at something and that's <coughs> sorry. That's a forest. And that is the bean I'm sure there are similar problems also in Africa and Latin America. And also the other thing and i wanted to say in the case of i'll get back to customary law again if there is time uh in the case of protected areas now in the international uh, treaties the conferences you know what they they look at is that each state will create 10% of its territory and declared as a protected area mm-hmm. uh an eco park a national park or something sanctuary uh, an elephant sanctuary a bird sanctuary something sanctuary but that is just the declaration of that area as a protected area now in bangladesh we protested against the wildlife act when it was passed and that only said one thing about indigenous peoples that okay as the, their customs will be taken into account while speaking blah 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 so at least so said oh so if we go and eat snails oh, we have an antler in our house <laughs> the police and the forest guards won't protect us and prosecute us that's the only good thing about it but they create all these things called protected areas and so forth and then they bring in a co-management regime where is the forest warden the forest warden deals with the thing and where where did we get all these models from the united kingdom and usa mm-hmm. yellowstone all those people with rifles and united kingdom united kingdom doesn't even have a forest anymore it doesn't have a forest one of the few countries doesn't have a forest apart from i don't know, I don't know deserts for the industrial revolution and all that they cut off everything except king william of normandy i think they had to create a forest for him to hunt uh, hunt wild boar or something like anyway so that's the other thing where i think azali we have we are still to go a long way in 
Yeah, I'm talking about so many countries. That's the regime of forest laws, the regime of you know uh, protected areas, and and also what I mentioned earlier about uh, the agribusiness and all those companies are coming in and taking over. And now, if, even in our region, I, I have seen some new huge plantations and and, and, and uh, things coming up. Uh, mm. uh, 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 what you call them, orchards coming up, or different uh, fruit species. Apparently, they are funded uh, under contract farming from Saudi Arabia somewhere. So some rich individuals, you know, send them money, and some poor farmer, for better or worse, you know, uh, cultivates something. And this is where I think indigenous peoples are also you know, suffering a lot, a lot. But let me get back to you, Raza, uh, Ghazali. Uh, where you think <laughs> I, I, I can talk more about or anything that you think I should go on. Um, Dev, from what I gather is that um, maybe it was interesting for you to hear you talk about what strategies that we can use um, that, that you would see deployed I believe because because um, you have all the observations and you have, you have thoughts on um, how to address these. Are we, yeah, from your uh, from your uh, breadth of knowledge? Because you had you have the uh, what I like to say the miles to know. Um, you've been um, not only former perm perm member but also co chair of the IP caucus in the working group on draft declaration. I can only imagine how 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 um intense that was in the drafting of the declaration and the former minister of state um in bangladesh as, as well surely you have uh, you've thought about um yeah um, um a strategy like how in terms of self-determination in, in the, the democracies um 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 etc cetera, etc cetera, like like how you how we could we can we can move move the needle forward um, I think that will be interesting to to um, to um, to hear from you. Also, um, and maybe and, and you, you, you can you can um, address it in any way you want or in any sequence that you want. I'm also interested. Um, what is your vision? Like, what do you what do you like to see happen? Um, you um, there, there's there's indigenous use coming up um, uh, from all over the world. And um, obviously you have a vision, you contribute so much to the, to the movement. Um, yeah, if you can, um, yeah, share that with us as well. That, that, I, I think that would be interesting uh, too. Um, let me uh, start off uh, with uh, some of the Madison strategies. Uh, mm. that can work in some circumstances, <laughs> not all. Sure. Yeah. Magic for all. Now, engagement at international levels uh, uh, that can, you know, help raise your status mm. for an indigenous people. It can also work for other uh, disadvantaged groups, women, persons with disability, minorities. Now, uh, I, I, I remember that. Uh, in one case, uh, there was an activist from one Asian country. Uh, I think they had gone to the Convention of Biological Diversity. And, uh, they were waiting for the host. And, uh, and, uh, and the host was the Minister of Environment of that country. And, and you know how it is that. Mm -hmm. There, you know, people get to know people and you talk. And so happened one of our indigenous activists became good friends with the Minister of Environment. Whereas the minister of her country at home didn't know the environment minister of the home. And he was sort of way behind in the line to go and greet the home where, where this activist of ours was on first name basis with the environment minister and, and sharing, a, I don't know, coffee or a mm. glass of wine or beer or whatever it was. So. Uh, and then when she, when she spoke to her environment minister, her country, it was like the dynamics had changed a lot. And so I don't know what 
really happened, but I would not be surprised that they said, hey, when I get back, why don't you come and have a cup of tea uh, with me in the ministry and we'll talk about your forest law policy that you had mentioned here and see if we can, you know, uh, get to agree. Mm. And, uh, and that sort of thing can happen. And, and, uh, it, and also sometimes, uh, apart from foreign uh, conferences, but if in your own country, you can, um, you can uh, use whatever leverage you can to build a relationship with the UN agencies. That can happen. I don't know to what extent it works, but we have been trying, and I think in some cases, like we are giving an example, we just had a, uh, uh, we asked for a virtual meeting with the you know, UN resident coordinator of Bangladesh. And the reason was the, 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 the UNDP and the United Nations Population Fund, they advised the, our Minister of Planning on its census. So our demand was simple, ethnically disaggregated data. We want the more than 50 indigenous peoples, it's called something less, like in, you know, uh, most countries don't like to use the word indigenous, they call us something other than indigenous. Sure, yeah. Although our laws, although our laws still contain the word indigenous in English and other mm -hmm. like, uh, and, and so we spoke to the, the, the uh, UN RESCO and the country, I forget the title of the UNFPA. So we brought in that first, we want all 50 people's names in, 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 in the census, it's going to happen in a few months. We want other, the questioners to include questions of like, are you an internally displaced person? Do you have access to cell phone? Do you have say, access to electricity, safe drinking water and all that, so that we get that disaggregation to the extent where we can tell the government, hey, aren't you supposed to uh, uh, implement the SDGs? How are you going to do that if you don't know where we stand because you didn't give us all those opportunities, nor did the colonial government when we were left out. So not even a single person is still left behind in the SDGs. So mm -hmm. we don't know if that's going to work, but we are, we have drafted a memorandum to the planning minister. And I happen to also, uh, you know, actually share a, uh, you know, another virtual with the minister. And so I got an opportunity to, to also tell him about some of these things. So we're going to, uh, 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 send a memorandum soon all from all over the country and also seek the support of the, the UN system. So I think this, sometimes the UN system can, although the minister may not talk to us, they may not know who are you, I mean, you know, especially if we, we, we don't belong to his constituency uh, and <laughs> we don't translate his votes and why, why should he care or, or she care for us. But mm -hmm. here the, the UN agents can raise their voice. And the outcome document says the UN agencies are responsible for the system-wide action plan. Uh, and they are responsible for also the national action plans that the governments do. And that mm. the government need technical advice from the UN agencies. And this is where I think the, I forget now, the previous Secretary General's uh, report, which was mentioned in the outcome document of the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples, mm -hmm. where called upon the UN agencies at country level to, to and I, I'm looking forward to actually meeting the IFA uh, chief uh, virtually soon. We are talking, a new chief has come from Latin America. Mm. So I think for all it's worth, so for example, if, if, if you have an, uh, a food and agriculture organization, FAO in your country, this, of course, this is not in USA or Canada, but it's in sure. developing countries. Then the, the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Food Program has dealings with the Ministry of Food, uh, uh, Ministry of Land, uh, uh, Ministry of Agriculture. And that's where like FAO has its voluntary guidelines, which is not as good as the IFAD policy, but still one of the most more progressive ones. It's voluntary, but if you get the Ministry of Agriculture and the land to grab onto that and, you know, uh, amend its land policy, amend its forest policy, amend its food policy, like food as the summit is coming and we're all concerned the other day, Pancho and uh, Joji mm -hmm. and Merna, and they were all saying, 
I felt concerned. Uh, Andrea about the summit, which is might exclude indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And so security is a something, but this is where I think strategic alliances with the UN agencies, uh, sometimes if they, and if they are not uh, uh, sensitive enough, we, we complain against them to, 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 to headquarters, whether in New York or Geneva or Rome or wherever they are. And so many of these UN agencies have their policies, not all. Many have their policy. IFAD has an amazingly progressive policy, and you know there's also uh, some structure in Rome whereby indigenous peoples uh, can engage with, uh, even at least once with the uh, policymaking bodies of the uh, IFAD. Sometimes also need FAO. So mm. the other thing I would say is capacity raising. Now, for example, if we were to engage with the FAO and the World Food Program or other UN body, it can be UNICEF, UNESCO, but then we have to do a homework. We have to know about these policies. That's why I'm doing, I am involved with a network of Bangladesh Indigenous Peoples Network for Biodiversity and Climate Change. Mm. And uh, the government actually took me as a member of the delegation to three climate change conferences. Not anymore. Maybe I spoke too much about indigenous rights. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but what we are trying to work on is capacity building, capacity raising. Now, for example, this World Bank thing I just told you, if we mm. had not known all these policies in depth, we were actually I'm doing some research with some other friends also on IFIs and indigenous people's rights in Bangladesh. So we're actually putting, putting the radar on the on uh, on World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and IFAD mm. because we work in health, education, environment, forestry, etc. Then you can actually look at the national policy, and then in some cases the donor or lender's policy trumps the government policy. When the government falls short of pre planned from consent or even pre planned from consultation or environment impact assessment, social impact assessment, or what have you, there are there are certain safeguards for all it's worth. Mm -hmm. But if you know about the content of the policy and the law, if you know about how they're supposed to be implemented and executed, we know the balance of whose responsibility is what, vis a vis the lender and the donor or even forget lender, be between the UN agency and the government ministry, mm. then we can speak from confidently from a position of strength and say, hey, I know you're supposed to do that and you're not doing it. Okay, you do it in a nice way, do it in a diplomatic way uh, by writing a very proper letter to your MP or your minister or whatever. Of course, maybe most times they don't listen. You do it again mm. or you join your friends who are doing a hunger strike or whatever. But I think Capacity raising. I've been working in this field uh, with communities for 40 years, believe me. And I still think, however long I live, I still wouldn't have done enough for our communities. There mm. are certain community, certain capacity shortages and weaknesses or the other, like women. Like, and I, or I just we just have uh, uh, in my region 20 years ago. You know, our traditional system, if I may speak about it a bit. Uh, please, please, please do. So we actually share a responsibility. I'm hereditary, so no mm. credit. I was not elected. I didn't sit for an exam to become chief. It just happens my, from several generations. Mm. Uh, from the 1600s, my, my family, uh, through male and female, have been chiefs. So, so in, in, we have three... Uh, territorial chiefs, if I call that circle chiefs, and then, then there, are, there are elected district councils or supposed to be elected, elected regional councils, and there we have uh, in our region, we have three members of parliament. But we chiefs are responsible for, as I told you earlier, for tribal justice, a little bit of civil and criminal as well, for allotment of lands, for shifting cultivation, protection of non-reserve uh, non forests. Mm. Uh, other forests and other natural resources, and for, of course, culture and all. 
So in our territory, we have, uh, we have, uh, in my territory is the largest of the three. We have three seven chiefs. We are almost 40% of the hill tracks. Uh, so we have 180 uh, uh, sub chiefs. And then we have sub sub chiefs, which is about uh, nearly 2000. Mm. Recently, we have uh, started appointing women chiefs of village, chiefs or elders. So this is the first time it's ever happened. I think 20 years ago, our men and the women would jail. Oh, can you have a woman chief? It's a contradiction. Chief can be a woman and a woman can't be a chief. Although mm. we had a Chakna queen, another uh, who the British did not like, but they couldn't depose her because she was really, really gutsy. A daughter of a peasant. She became queen because the king married her. So we have now a few hundred women village chiefs and there, they are called Karbari, Karbari. And they are responsible for justice, culture, and, and we are trying to get them also for land and natural resource. And things are changing from not having any woman at that level as a chief, but in the elected uh, 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 councils, you have some women not. And I think the dynamics are changing a lot. And this is where I think indigenous people suffer from one problem. I think we brush some of our things that we don't want others to know under the carpet. And it's like, uh, you know, uh, some of my socialist friends telling me that, hey, yeah, let us get a classless, stateless society and a socialism. And uh, we'll get the women's rights as well and indigenous rights as well. Wait for that. So mm -hmm. they wait for another 500 years, 1,000 years. You it's the same with women's rights. And you say, oh, let's get ourselves determination and autonomy first. The people as a nation as a whole, and then the women's, uh, indigenous women's rights will also come. I, I don't think so. And, and, and this is where I think uh, we ought to be honest, indigenous peoples, and admit that, hey, maybe in some respects, discrimination against our women is of a different type than mainstream. And in some cases, it is less. But to say that it does not exist, even in matrilineal societies, in Garo, Kasi, in Northeast India, and Bangladesh, I'm not talking about uh, poly polyandrical societies. I don't know about them. Mm. In, mm -hmm. that in parts of China. Uh, but here, we have the problem that we ought to admit we have certain problems, and we ought to do something and not just wait for the state and mainstream society. And, so, so CEDO can also have an internal indigenous CEDO. We ought to have an internal indigenous CRC, the Convention of the Rights of the Child. That what are we doing at village level? What are we doing at clan level to say that, hey, like, like polygyny, we do uh, have uh, polygyny, many wives. I don't say polygamy, but polygamy means many marriages. If you remember. Mm. So, Unfortunately, in some societies, it still exists. In our societies, we have 11 peoples. It is clearly on the decline, but it has not gone. And this is one thing, Ghazali, uh, uh, with regard to indigenous peoples in Bangladesh, India, and Malaysia, whether even if the state does not you know, like the word self-determination, we are exercising self-determination right to personal law, I told you, where the, the lady judge with the hijab gave us the very fair judgment of mm. saying that hey, this is yours. And in the case of two cases of succession in the highest court, the court said the government has no right to interfere with the succession of a chiefship. This is completely a matter of customary law and the government must recognize whoever is the heir to that chief. Mm. So, so in some cases we have that advantage. But in some cases, I go and say just because uh, we did things in this manner, uh, for example, uh, some women cannot enter a place of worship uh, when, uh, uh, when, when they have the menstrual cycle. Now, that may have been something right in 200 years ago. But how can it be accepted that as right? A man will not go underneath a woman's cloth 
he's a warrior like many of our people have or had warrior traditions you know mm. and these are the things you cannot do you can do and I'm, i i go to the villages every time i go to the villages i make a point whenever i can i sit uh, uh, with the women and if my spouse or my colleagues uh, of human rights organizations the women are going to go that's better that you, know, you can mix more freely with the women mm. and really get to know the lads i i mix with the boys separately the elders the children and i say no formal sittings with all those stages and you know what about marquees and banners and thing we're going to sit on the table on the floor or whatever and then you get in and i try to talk about this thing and say hey just because it was this was done by my great great grandfather at that time no we we we, we cannot do that in the old days there were certain things was completely discriminatory against against uh, 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 women mm. now so i think there are ways and if we left it to the state because our indigenous societies will not listen to something just because it is the mp or minister from another tribe now the language says that but if it's your own elders if it's your own youth and that's where i want to come to the youth thing that you mentioned and mm-hmm. that's where i was really excited gazali you're saying that many of the things uh, we guys and girls who've been there for like <laughs> 40 years 30 years <laughs> i don't know uh, but when it comes to changing that i was saying that you no know, we movers and shakers are the youth expanded definition of you mm. me yeah, to me all right so <laughs> for me anybody below 40 is you or even 45 <laughs> so and the thing is that one thing there are a few things that you have both of the strength the vitality but there are two things one is having a dream and a vision the other thing having the guts the courage the moral courage to act mm. whereas all the people some that have seen so many side of the world trying to get cynic now i'm sure you've heard the phrase everybody says the phrase in english good old days yes now the good old days is someone who is elderly he's saying because he or she can't move around no much less mobility less energy less strength so many ailments all over your body or whatever it is then of course you are reminded of your youth where i mean how, how do they say it in english i have no idea in my language you say that when you're young and healthy and you know the world you know it looks like you can do any any and everything mm. obviously you know they are reminded of all those nice things that happened to their lives and compared to that nice things you don't have new things happening to you to elderly as much as happens to you so then they tend to think good old days then the opposite of good old days is what bad young days or bad now days so these days are bad only the days that were in the past are good but then the youth of course to them the present is the best world no matter how bad it is to the youth older people it's the best mm. so they can dream they can dream that's the thing with the problem with not all, not all you know not like people like you know all my brothers and sisters like mirna and uh, you know uh, andre uh, and many of the lots anders from from sweden to many of our you know friends they are exceptions vicky they are exceptions i think even at the 80 they still be dreaming and having visions mm. but they are exceptions but, but for the rest you need within your community and your society and your organization people who are optimistic who can see at the end of the day that some change it's like i was always saying that yeah, a glass half full somebody will call it half full and somebody call it half empty mm. so youth can dream that's one the youth have the guts you look around bangladesh started out as the students movement in 1969 in 1952 there was the mother language mother tongue movement and it was students 
You see it in France. You see it in the United States. Uh, you said in the Arab Spring, everywhere, mm-hmm. many parts, Southeast Asia, Thailand, Indonesia, Myanmar, Burma, Philippines. It's the youth who have the conscience of society. And this is where I think that indigenous part, but the things that, what, what, what problem? Papa, I'm, t- I'm talking about to just Uncle Ghazali. All right, all right, you can take my phone. This is my little, little, hello, okay, Baba. Say hello to Uncle Ghazali. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay, off you go. Nice shirt. <laughs> Baba has to talk, okay? Go, go. Um, so, but what is important is that the youth and the elderly don't dealing from each other. Mm. So sometimes amongst indigenous societies or, or, or developing country uh, societies, what happens is there's some sort of a sort of almost segregation. Mm. It's not, not just, you know, sex-based segregation, but also, you know, age-based segregation. Where, where you know, the elderly sit on one side, and if the elderly speak, the, the youngsters have to sort of listen with deep respect and not speak, not interrupt, and all that. Mm. But the opposite might be also true, where in fact I have seen in the dinners or otherwise, where the youth are behaving disrespectfully towards right. elders. I, I think that's something that is doesn't fit in with indigenous uh, culture. Most indigenous societies have this thing for, but that does not necessarily mean, even listen to everything the old people say and the pe- only the people with the gray heads know everything. But what I'm concerned about is that having said that, the youth uh, uh, are, are the ones who will do, you know, the hard work, who will take the risks and who will sustain the work. What has to happen is that a partnership with the others. And this is where also the whole question of transmission of knowledge, Mm. of traditional knowledge, to even norms of democracy. Now, uh, I I think I told you about Malaya, I told you about the shared labor, shared produce. But there's also shared voices and shared years Mm. where you must listen to even the most young, weakest member of your community. I think this is part and parcel of most indigenous cultures. But but maybe you're forgetting that. And I I remember that things are changing with now in the urbanization, people living in apartments and small houses. But in the old days, I saw not a single house ever had a living room where somebody didn't sleep at night. Mm. In the daytime, you have the settee or sofa or chair or whatever. And in the evening, you know, it, 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 like, like, like you have, what do you call these things? Uh, uh, you have these in, in the West, you know, there's sofa bed, you know, it, it converts into a, a bed. I forget what it's called. <laughs> uh, so, you always shared your space with some relative. If you live in the towns, then some of your poorer relatives don't have a house to go to college, university, or school. Mm-hmm. And that cousin, we always had cousins in my own house to everybody's house. Some cousin or niece or nephew coming and staying in, in your house just in order to go to school or college. Right. Now, so, so you are sharing your space. You are, you, we share food. Uh, and of course, when there is a death in the family, there is a, it's a custom that every family will contribute something for the funeral expenses. Like mm-hmm. In Torah, they, do, they maybe overdo it. <laughs> I don't know. It's, you heard of those huge, huge festivals of buffaloes being killed and there are all these dance processions. I'm just joking. They don't overdo anything. It's their right. culture. And so these things have happened. These things have happened and they still happen to an extent, but in many cases, because of urbanization, the lifestyle has changed. Now, in that case, maybe there's somebody hankering from a beautiful villa with a swimming pool in it or whatever it is. Now, here it is the, the creature comforts, the keeping up with the Joneses, mm. uh, 
and luxury, uh, overindulgence in your senses, and, and the whole thing of status, of wealth and power and influence and all that. And just as I, you know, I have dreams. <laughs> I also have nightmares. <laughs> and the nightmare is this, that we remain indigenous in name. We join ceremonies, even wearing costume or whatever it is, or even speaking the language and partaking of the food or drink. But the rest of the 364 days, we conduct ourselves as an individual who is only after his or her or her family or narrow you know, clan or group or whatever's uh, interest to the exclusion of, of other people. Mm. And so that group feeling, if we cannot retain what the, the Malaya spirit, I want to call it, the collective spirit, then we will cease to be indigenous people. And I, and I say that I was actually comparing, I was actually comparing the difference between an indigenous minority being at the receiving end of discrimination hmm. and, and, and the non-indigenous minority, both are uh, uh, religious minorities to say. And I'm talking about a real example. I will not name sure. the community concern. I could see the difference was this, that the indigenous people, even the wealthy, and the not so wealthy or indigent, ordinary, low income family person, their interests were intertwined. And if there was race, ethnic riots, both were victimized or felt victimized. And they would act to resist. In our town, it happened at least three times in the last 20 something years mm. where people organized themselves to resist racist attacks, communal attacks, ethnic attacks with knives and a bit of smaller cocktails, a little bit of gunpowder, not big arms, but yeah, and all that. But when it, we compared that with the religious minorities, the difference was in the our people would not migrate to the bigger cities because they don't want to assimilate. But the religious minorities, they don't look different from the other. You only know when they go to the, the church or temple or mosque, well, who's a Christian, who's a Hindu, or who's a Muslim. Mm -hmm. You see them on the road, they look similar. They are not ethnic, ethnically different. It's just religious. Yeah. So they tend to go to the cities. They tend to leave the country. They tend to sell all their lands and migrate to the city or to a different country and all that. But indigenous peoples until lately did not do that. So that way they could put up a more effective resistance to ethnic riots. No, you know, you can think some of the very bad things that happened in Western Indonesia or even Kalimantan, mm -hmm. you know, that's with the Dayaks and others then with the Christians and Muslims in, 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 in Western uh, Eastern Indonesia, uh, uh, but similar sort of things happened here. And this is where I think uh, the indigenous collective spirit really came. I am not at all for, for fighting, and I'm glad that actually fighting did not happen, but a little mm -hmm. bit of thing where mm -hmm. there's resistance. So mm -hmm. I think that collective spirit still helps. But as I was saying, I have the nightmare that when all you're after is your bank balance mm. and your membership of that whatever club and your children going to an Ivy League university or whatever it is. And that's where I think that we lose our sense of belonging to the collective. And then it doesn't matter whether you're president or minister or whoever, a general or a director of such bank or whatever it is, then but people also do not respect you. Of course, they'll go to you because they need a job, want to borrow some money from you, or want to marry your daughter, or want your son to marry their daughter. Mm. But 
in the longer sense, if you still have a strong sense of community, but that, I think, if I may say so, I have seen both sides. Mm. I've seen people sell their souls out for money, the bank balance. But I've also seen that even with the differences in sort of like income status, that people can still be a nation and a people. And I want to give actually one example of one community uh, who are not indigenous actually, but I, uh, an example of unity. I don't know if you know about the Ismaili community headed by His Highness the Aga Khan. No. I, I, actually, I actually happened to the, the minister in waiting, he was given the status of a head of state. Oh, okay. Wow. Bangladesh in 2008. So mm. for me, you know, going around with him everywhere to the provincial palace. <laughs> to, so for hours and hours, we spoke. And he was very kind to say he has headquarters in Paris. That I should go and visit him, whatever. And he would make time to see me. But he told me about how they have arbitration rules amongst his people. They are spread all over the world. I think the overall population all over the world is, I don't know, two to 400,000, <coughs> less than half a million. Mm. He has a courtesy title of His Highness from the British Queen. He has a huge uh, 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 organization, uh, uh, what you call it, foundation sort of a thing, where he funds uh, architecture, education. Mm. His community in Bangladesh is very small. They are probably hardly less than 50,000, 20,000. But I think not even 5% of them are poor. You don't find poor Ismailis. Mm. Because they're extremely united. They never go to a court of law. If they have a dispute among this, they arbitrate with their own counsels and arbitrators. If they, they have a weak uh, person in the in their community, they give loans, interest free or low interest. And, but, but, they are, but they know very well how to engage in the market economy. And that's where I think we indigenous peoples also have to change. I had heard the Maori had, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, some strategy to have 100 PhDs every year or something like that. I don't know. Mm. Anyway, that's interesting. So we live in a capitalist world. Not, I would not go with extreme capitalism where just profit and you know, just you know, exploiting laborers and others to earn. I don't believe in that, but people have the right to be a little richer than others if they live. That one should not think ill of them, but we also need to engage in the market and learn skills. And every other day, we find here, you know, we look for plumbers, we don't have a single indigenous plumber in our town. We have a few masons, and I have mm. not known a poor plumber anywhere. In Australia, when I went as a poor student, when I had differences with the government, I said I left the country yeah. uh, one and a half years. I got a scholarship to Australia, and I applied for a political asylum. I would have got it. Mm. But then General Ashad was overthrown, and so I came back to our elections, not to stand, but to help. But anyway, uh, talking about this, though, we are plumber. We are mason. There are so many trades and vocations where everybody is not going to become a PhD or a general or a civil servant or a millionaire. What of those others who don't make it, who don't go beyond secondary school, mm. who don't go beyond primary school? We need to give them employment. And I think that for me, it's not just the higher end things of self-determination and autonomy. It's the very simple things of every child having nutrition uh, in the family. Now I've been sometimes talking against some of my overzealous Buddhist monks who are talking about non-violence and saying, don't keep chickens and don't fish. Then I was telling the, uh, the monk, your, your, your venerable, uh, uh, where, where will that uh, child get frozen fish from, from a supermarket? There is no supermarket, no fridges there. Mm. They have to eat the crabs and the prawns and the fish. And that is not a violation of the, the tenant against killing, uh, you know, it's similar to thou shalt not kill, sort of it is not. Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, so these are also the things that I think indigenous peoples have to work on and indigenous peoples, we need the mentoring. That is an amazing thing where we don't know, we haven't found the answers, but we know we have the question, which is that our, our youth need mentoring. 
from friendly elders to other people a little more experienced than them, to guide them as to where, what they do with their studies, what they do with their trades and professions, what they do, even if they want to engage as an activist, what they do in the human rights field and the, the field of politics, how their dreams can become reality where the older person sort of experience can help guide them. Mm. So, so I'm just telling you the problem, not the solution, that we're still grappling with the elderly and youth to engage as we are still also grappling with men and women that has improved a lot, we still have problems. Mm. So these are some of the really, really crucial issues that we face. There are no straightforward, clear solutions and we need to explore uh, new ways and also see the old ways. We shouldn't just think the old ways are all necessarily irrational or ineffective and see how we can uh, go ahead to deal right. with these necessary problems. Mm. That's it. Thanks so much for sh uh, sharing that, uh, Dev, because it's um, a very beautiful insight um, and also sharing your the, the nightmare, the potential nightmare that you that you have. Um, Dev, I, I, I think I kept you as long as your family uh, allowed you <laughs> allowed me to. Um, any 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 parting words? Any any thoughts that you? Um, and obviously, uh, before you go into that, um, I would love if you have any additional thoughts that we do another uh, uh, um, conversation. We do because uh, I think there's so much more that we we can or that you can uh, that touch upon or do you want to touch upon? Um, so I, I'll I'll uh, give you this open invitation. Obviously, if there's anything that you. Um, yeah, uh, would like to share or, or expand on and that we can, um, yeah, schedule, sit down again uh, at some point um, at, at your convenience, obviously. Uh, but I, uh, I want, do want to respect your, the, the sanctity of your, of your home and, and, your, and your wife and allowing me to, uh, to um, hijack you, and, and you uh, for, 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 um, yeah, for, for a brief moment in, on your Monday. Um, yeah, anything that you would like to, uh, that you, still want to highlight or, or underline um, that we talked about or did not talk about today? Uh, I will only mention it. Uh, and if we get an opportunity in the future, not just me, actually, I'd very much love to talk along with other people, not just one-to-one, mm. you know, uh, -one, but have, I don't know, five, six people, or as you think, and the things I had in mind were on what we didn't touch very much, which is actually the very essence of our identity as a people, culture. There is language. We are grappling with a huge problem of language and script. Mm. Uh, our people have a script. Many others use Roman. But primary education in our uh, mother tongue-based multilingual education, MTBMLE, is a fact now, but it's still in its uh, infancy. Uh, that is a huge challenge, and not just children at school, but also language. Uh, our Chakma script recently got recognition by UNESCO. Mm. So it's part of the Unicode, so we can do it ah. on Facebook and all that, along with, I think, some Native American script in USA. Mm. Yeah. So then there's games, traditional indigenous games and sports. And I've heard a little bit happening in North America and, 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 and Scandinavia, but uh, why not Southeast Asia or Pacific or Africa, that everywhere that, that we need, not just indigenous Olympics, but also at, at regional, sub-regional levels should promote. I always promote in my territory and we have revived old, old games of tops, of uh, like archery and all. And they're coming back. If you mm. make them do it, they do. And there's one day I will show you some uh, things about how people, men and women play with a little pot where oh. every part of your body is, including your ears to your toes, is used. Both men and women, I'll show you that. Wow. I, I can't do it. <laughs> then cuisine, cuisine. Every time if, I, if, in, if a diplomat comes, a UN, an ambassador comes to our house, we would, my spouse and I, we will always give them indigenous cuisine. Mm. The Muslim or a Jew will not serve 
uh, haram or kosher, but otherwise we will serve everything that is our own food. And I have seen them cleaning up the plates. Uh, so there must be something, every people have their own cuisine, indigenous languages. We should be proud of it, but we should also cultivate it. Then there's lastly, there's dress and costume. Uh, uh, th that's also things I, 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 I wear, I, I wear more and more indigenous costume as I grow older. And our women are bringing back the old, even at weddings. And 20, 25 years ago, our women had lost, stopped wearing our dress mm. for the mainstream dress at weddings. But now 90% it's come back to traditional, at least mm. on the day of your wedding and also on festivals. And there are other parts of culture, which is not just song and dance. It's the way you think the way you respect others, the way you treat nature, then there are all those amazing, amazing taboos of what you can do and what you can't do with your landscape. Mm. Why build huts on stilts? Why do not cut earth? Why is it a sin to cut earth? To why the deer and the elephant can come and have the salt where humans may not touch that. So there are an amazing breadth of you know, all these quaint customs, practices, taboos, beliefs in spirits and gods uh, of different elements, which has helped ecology, but has also helped animals and bird wildlife. And I'll end with this, with Corona, I'm, I'm going to, uh, with COVID, our bird life, on, I live on an island, mm. in Okars, our bird life has quadrupled. I have some shots and I'm, hoping to make a film in the Chakma language, my own language, and people don't even so they know the names of the birds and where they live. So the brighter side of COVID is mm. uh, uh, nature as getting a chance to, you know, recuperate. Right, and right. We should yeah. also think of the bright side of COVID-19 and indigenous culture. Awesome. The, 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 um, um, yeah, so some... Um... Something that I want to share with you, uh, Dev, and I'm thank very thankful that you brought this up. Script, language, traditional games, sports, cuisine. Um, I'm, I'm a part-time chef, so um, that this is something that I very much like, and dressing costumes, and especially taboos and culture. Um, we're bringing back, like, you, you were part of it, the How to Indigenous Now webinar series, because you, you were talking, like, one segment by yourself, and then we had the, the roundtable. We're bringing it back. Um, and not just on governance and diplomacy, because we already did that, but we're also going to bring in like more topic, topics that are more practical, like cuisine and dress and, and education and, and, and healthcare and everything else. Um, so we'll bring that uh, towards the um, somewhere in autumn, in, in, like in fall of, of this year. Um, so definitely um, uh, would love to have you in, in that lineup as well. Uh, and th that is also a, like, like you said, talking to five or six or seven other people and just to, to share thoughts um, with the people on the likes of Daily Sambo, uh, Megan, Professor Megan Davis and, and all the other people. And I think, um, yeah, I, I just, I just love to, 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 to do, to do it and just be a wallflower and listen to you, to amazing people like yourself, um, share wisdom, share, share knowledge, visions. And, and your interactions. Help me to remember <laughs> and then try to express it in a way others understand. You poke me well. <laughs> no, I, I, and I, I yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you so, for much, uh, so much for taking the time to uh, um, to get into this conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll definitely keep in touch. I'll let you know what, uh, when it's um, when this all will take place. And uh, yeah. Please send my best to your to your family, uh, your spouse, and and, and your lovely uh, child who just now came home, I believe. Um, and we'll we'll yeah we'll um, we'll um, yeah keep talking. I would say. <laughs>